All right. Well, welcome and hello, Cinemeric Nation, and welcome to Simply Cinemeric Live. I'm your host, Chris Pollock, and today we are going to explore the world of three axis milling, specifically setting up a milling machine. But uh, before we get started, I do want to mention that I have a colleague of mine, Lars Fowler. He's on the line. So he is going to be monitoring the chat window. Um, one of the things that we do in these sections is we don't necessarily reserve a spot at the end for Q&A. We want these to be kind of live interactive segments. So as we go through the content, if you have a question, by all means, please throw it out and Lars will feed it to me. He's in my handy little Bluetooth ear, my little ear tooth in my left ear, and we'll be able to take those questions. Now, additionally, before we continue on to the topic. I do want to mention that uh, we really enjoy doing these videos, but I hope you guys do. And by all means, if you are getting um, some you know, good information out of this stuff and, and you enjoy the content, you want to keep it coming, make sure you like the videos. If you're not already, please subscribe to my channel. Um, and there should be a little bell indicator there for you that even when you're subscribing, if you check the bell, it'll give you a notification when we have new stuff scheduled and coming up. So you'll be able to find out about that new stuff. Um, not sure how you guys have been getting the information so far. We certainly do some email blasting and whatnot. But, but anyway, uh, make sure you, you like these videos, follow them, and let us know so we can keep on producing them and keep on delivering this content. So without further ado, we are going to delve into the world of um, setting up a three-axis milling machine. Real quick, let me just check with Lars. Everything sounding good from your size, Lars? So Lars gives us a big thumbs up so we can continue moving. Okay, so you know, to be honest with you, I did a little bit of exploring when I decided I wanted to do a how to set up a three-axis milling machine. You know, I figured, you know, let me see what's out there. Let me see what, you know, other colleagues and, you know, YouTubers or guys on social media have been pushing out. And, and I tell you, I was really surprised and impressed. There is a lot of really solid content that talks about, you know, stoning a table, squaring up a vise, setting some zeros, all the different tools and indicators. But I did see a common theme throughout. And in my mind, there was a couple key critical steps that is consistently being overlooked when setting up a milling machine. So we're gonna start with those steps. So, so for me, I kinda, I frame it up that there's five key steps when setting up a milling machine. And a lot of times, we always think of the first step as mounting that vise and squaring it up, you know, making sure it's deburred and whatnot. But there's really two steps prior to that. So step one, leveling your machine. Now you might say, well, Chris, my machine was put in by a highly qualified technician. It's perfectly level. And I have no doubt that when that guy came in, he gave you a perfectly leveled machine. However, is it still level? So machines are gonna settle over time. It could be something as simple as he didn't have exactly the perfect weight distribution on every leveling pad. Nobody's gonna get it there. So the, the casting's gonna level out. Cast iron ages over time. Even if it's a mean eye casting, there's still an aging process, so things will settle. Um, and probably more importantly, your floors move around. You know, it's, everybody thinks concrete is a solid, stable surface, but well, those slabs kind of shift and move around. So it's important to periodically level your machine. Now, with that being said, I am certainly not stating that you need to level your machine when you set up every single job. That's not the case. But what I would say is maybe make it part of your preventative maintenance process. So maybe you do it you know, every, every month or every quarter, perfect time to do it is when I just took down my work holding and everything's clean and I clean the machine thoroughly and, and I drop my vise on. So there's another great time to check it, but you certainly want to check it. So we're going to go through that process to make sure everybody knows the, at least in my opinion, the proper way to level a machine. Next step, step two is tramming your head. Now, a lot of you guys that have been in industry a long time or have run bridge ports or machines where they have knuckles and adjustable heads are probably very familiar with the term. But some of you guys may not, especially if it's guys that have been running rigid heads. Because typically you would say that, well, why do I have to check tram? I can't adjust it, right? It's a rigid head. And what is tramming? Just for those of you that might not be familiar with the, the topic, it's the process of verifying that your table surface is parallel and perpendicular to your z-axis and your spindle 
right? So what we'll do when we get there is put an indicator up on the spindle, and we're going to sweep a circle on the table. And checking any deviation as that spindle spins around is telling me that I have a squareness issue. So why do I check tram on a rigid head? Well, you'll be amazed to know that, believe it or not, you can adjust tram and induce tram if it's a small amount. We're not talking about you know, five thousandths of an inch here, but a thou, a thou and a half. You can actually affect that tram by the two center leveling pads underneath this machine. So this machine has six pads in total. Pretty common for a C-frame machine like this. You have four outside pads, but then there are two pads directly underneath the inside of that column. And you'd be amazed as you load or unload those pads slightly, that column can sway and actually affect tram. So back in the day when I was a service technician, a lot of years ago, I don't want to date myself, um, we, that's how what we would do to install a new machine, right? We would get her on the customer's floor, we would make sure that it's level. And you know, everybody thinks level is, is this highly important thing that you have to be perfectly straight. You can have a machine sitting at a 45 degree angle as long as when it was set up and qualified that it was at a 45 degree angle of the factory, that's all you're doing with level. You're trying to get it to the same plane and state that it was when the machine was qualified, right? When it was checked for all its geometry. So that's what you're doing with level. And then we would go and we tram the head and adjust our leveling pads. Now I will say, if you see large deviation, you do, that is, uh, there's a time to kind of take pause and you're probably gonna to need to get somebody in that has a lot of expertise in squaring up the machine for sure. So, step two, tramming ahead. Step three, now we're in the world of kind of what we know, is really at the time when I would mount a vise up. So we will throw a vise on the table. I'm gonna give you a, a couple different processes as to how to square up that vise. And then from there, step four is gonna be setting our part, dropping a piece of stock in the vise and setting a part zero. Now the fifth step, would certainly be setting your tools. We're not going to have time today to go through tools, but what we will, um, you know, if you check out some of the other videos, I have done a lot of stuff on setting tools. So certainly I would take a look at some of those. So now, without further ado, let's kind of get into it and let's talk about level. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure you get yourself a precision machinist level. There are certainly a bunch of different levels um, out there. This one is the Starrett 12 inch. This is the 98-12. Um, now this isn't a, a super high precision. Um, this would be a half a thou per foot on my graduations, which uh, typically is, is sufficient. Um, if I'm on a machine that's very large, uh, can induce a lot of flex, I might want to spend some money and get a much higher precision level. They go up to 5 tenths per foot for sure. But for any of our purposes here, um, certainly will work quite well. Now, before you start cranking things around, before you start moving stuff around, one of the things you're going to want to do is verify that your level is accurate. Now, you'd say, well, why wouldn't my level be accurate? I just bought it. Well, levels are adjustable. A lot of people don't realize that. And there's a very simple way to check how good your level is. It doesn't matter if you're on a level surface. You're not going to need some kind of perfectly flat datum surface, but what you are going to do is you need to be on some surface where the bubble is within its range. So you can't be so far out that the bubble's maxed to one side or the other. You'll never be able to check it. And now what you do is just set the level down on the surface. So in my case, I'm about one line, a little shy to the left. It's probably hard for you guys to see it. You have to take my word for it. And then what you do is you're going to take the level. Now I like to pick them up just because if I spin them on the table, I do have a tendency to scratch the tables a bit. I certainly try to take, keep this machine very nice and pretty for all my fam, film work. But what you want to do is you want to spin it 180, drop it back down the same surface, and verify you've got the exact same measurement in both directions. Any discrepancy you see is your level being out of true. And believe it or not, these are designed to be adjusted. They're intended to be adjusted. So on the Starrett, there is a little jam screw, lock screw scenario here on one end. So if I was getting any discrepancy in Mine's pretty close. I mean, if I'm, boy, maybe a quarter of a line off, it's not much. You do want to let them settle out. So they do take a second to settle. Um, but I can then, with this jam nut, move this level up or down, just on the one side, and just keep moving it back and forth, flipping it over and over until I get a nice, consistent reading. Now my level is true. So don't start leveling things unless you know you have a true level. It's a very easy thing to check. 
Then from there, it's really time to validate my level. Now on a small machine like this, generally I'll probably center the table. Um, larger machines, you might take these measurements over the length of the travel, specifically maybe in, in Y. You want to be careful throwing the X on, a, on this style machine to the left or right, because you can start to get table rock. And obviously that's going to change your level. So you want everything centered over top of the, you know, the main mass of the machine. Now, generally speaking, when we level a machine, we're going to look at it in two directions, right? We're going to look at it in the x-axis, then we're going to move our level, we're going to set it here, and we're going to look at it on the y. And I'm going to potentially see some discrepancy. Now, this is probably the, one of the most common mistakes when leveling a machine that I see people do, is they now go, okay, well, my machine, I see I'm a little off in a bubble. Now, what I do like to do if I want to verify which direction I have to pick up or down, is I may pick the level up just a little bit. So mine is a shy low in the front end. Very, very minimal, but I could adjust that here. But what I don't want to do is start cranking my, my leveling pads. So there's two things I need to do. First, I want to take the center pads, if I know I got to adjust this machine, and I want to get them out of the scenario. What you want to do is you want to isolate the machine to your outside pads. Hopefully three or four, depending on your machine configuration. Most common you're going to see on these machines would be four pads. So get her up on the four pads, have the center two pads out of the equation because you don't want it to teeter on those pads. Now next is I don't want to try adjusting two pads simultaneously because you're going to be bouncing back and forth and you're going to be chasing your tail as you move around. So the trick is you actually want to set your level on your 45s. So if I kind of point the level between my two leveling pads or at a 45 degree angle, now, as I check both measurements, I can isolate to one pad or the other, and I can determine one specific pad I want to adjust. And then you're going to work it that way. Now, what I would recommend is you always want to try to level up, not down. Because what happens is, you know, in this one, I'm a little bit, like I said, a little bit low here. So I could lift up the front pad, or I could loosen the back pad. But what happens is when I go to loosen the back pad, I have some other leveling pads that I can start teetering on. If I'm always loading, the worst I'm going to get is I'm going to move away from the other pads. But if I go the other direction, then I'm, I don't know if I'm actually putting too much weight on those pads and the machine's now teetering or rocking. So try to, if you can, always go up. Usually if I'm setting a brand new machine on a floor, I will set it at its lowest possible position just making sure that the, the, the casting itself is not touching any concrete anywhere. So I want to see daylight throughout the entire machine. And then this way I can work my way up over time. So on this machine, I would start, and I'm not going to climb under the machine right now. We certainly don't have time for it. But I would go to this pad, give it a little turn, get it perfect, move to my other 45, and just work it back and forth until you get all four pads there. Once I've gotten it sitting on all four pads, then I want to reintroduce my two center pads. Now in this case, I'm just going to bring them down until I'm just getting load on them. And I want to get it to a point where maybe I just see the bubble kind of shudder just a little bit. You don't want to put too much load because then again, you can cause the machine to start teetering. So you want to be careful with that. And you're going to set your load. Now your machine should be pretty level. So once I've checked that and I've adjusted that, my next step is verifying my tram. So you got a couple ways to verify tram. Certainly I can use a little mag base with a test indicator. This is probably a pretty common method. Um, the other thing that a lot of times I'll use is an, an Indicol style base that would mount either on the nose of a spindle or on a, on a tool holder with an indicator. But what you're gonna do is you wanna have the indicator mounted to the spindle and then we're gonna come down and we're going to sweep our table. All right, so here I'm going to use my mag base. I got a 40 taper. So luckily my mag base fits right there. Now when you're setting an indicator, a lot of people don't realize, but you want to try to maintain a 15 degree angle between the needle tip and the surface you're touching. Now if you look in any of your documentation that comes with the indicators, generally speaking, standard indicator will tell you to maintain that angle. Anything you get off that angle, is going to be, okay, we're going to move the Y a little bit here. Mm -hmm. All right, 
So, so anything beyond that angle is going to give you error. So what I'm doing here is I'm just taking a quick sweep, getting the spindle somewhat centered. Now, obviously, the max I'm going to be able to check would be my table width. So in this case, my table is a 12-inch wide table. So I'm going to get roughly a little less than a 6-inch radius to sweep. Now, I can go right off the table surface. I can use a uh, one, two, three block. I can use a gauge block, right? I can, I can grab one of these one, two, three blocks. It really depends on your, your table surface. So in my case, I have a nice ground flat table surface. So I can go right off the table and that's what we're going to do. But what if you have a flaked table, right? A hand flaked table. Real common on a lot of the bridge ports you'll see that on. Um, other, you know, other machine builders like to use those style tables. Um, why they use them, in case you were always wondering, give me a little more of an angle here on my needle, is uh, the flake tables will actually hold or capture oil. So it makes moving around parts on the surface very easy. Um, Fidel notoriously would flake all their tables um, and make sliding things around. What's tricky though is when I'm setting things like a tram, as you spin the ta as you spin the indicator around, you're going to see it bouncing up and down, right? It's going in and out of the valleys. So in that case, I would absolutely have to use a one, two, three block or draw block. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin and I'm going to kind of record where it is around the circle. You notice I'm trying to avoid touching the arm. They do have a tendency to settle out. So a lot of times I'll let it settle myself and then keep checking it. Um, from there, you're just going to spin around the circle and verify or validate that this machine is within tram. And if it's not, and you're only a little bit out, I mean, mine is, this is a half down indicator and I'm, I'm barely seeing any motion. But if I saw a little bit, now I would go to those two center leveling pads and slightly load or unload and check to see the results of that. Now, generally speaking, where you're going to see that correct an issue is if the column is sagging forward or back. Left to right, not so much. But if you have an, an issue and you're not holding, you know, on this machine, I certainly would expect to see better than a half thou, which I am. So if I saw a couple thou of, of tram issue on this machine, well, now I've got a problem. But I don't know enough to correct the issue. So really, there's one of two things that could be going on now. Either my spindle isn't parallel to my table surface, or my Z is not moving perpendicular, right? My whole column could be tipped at an angle left to right or front to back. Now to check that, you're now gonna need to get a ground knee. Uh, we used to use a concrete, uh, concrete knee, or I mean a concrete, a granite knee to be able to square up our tables back in my service days. Uh, but you would need a qualified knee to now check squareness, check perpendicularity. So that's where I'd say if, if you're chasing a big problem, now's the time to bring in somebody with that kind of expertise. And then, you know, if it's a linear rail machine like this, there's actually a floating rail that can adjust the squareness. So if maybe you bump the head, you could have kicked the rail out a little bit. But certainly by checking tram and validating that it's beyond what you'll be able to tweak or adjust can tell you that there's a problem going on. So from there, how are we doing on questions? Anything for us, Lars? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. And, and I'm glad this person asked that because that is probably one of the biggest no-nos when setting a machine is when you place it on the concrete, you straddle a seam. So what happens with, with concrete is concrete, like we were talking about a little bit before, it shifts and it moves, right? It moves up and down, it moves left and right. Well, your problem is if you're over top of a seam, then the machine's going to start to move around on you like that. So you never want to straddle a seam. You always want to isolate it. I mean, I've actually had uh, machines where we had to go in and have the customer move the machine because it was a big, giant 120-inch lathe, and they had the headstock, four bolts on the headstock, sitting on a different pad or different, different concrete surface than the rest of the machine. And it was all kinds of squareness issues and surface issues and chatter. It was uh, some pretty ugly stuff. So uh, by all means, you want to avoid that like the plague. If, uh, if you have that issue, cut it out, pour yourself an isolated pad. It's the only way you're going to get that machine to run properly. 
Any other questions as we start to get ready for setting our vise? So the process of leveling is certainly the same and, and validating squareness, but if there is a problem, then the solution for fixing a squareness issue is very different. Um, that's one of the nice things about a linear rail machine is because of the way you can adjust the rails, you have some potential chance of correcting geometrical issues in a machine. If you're on a box swing machine, that stuff, excuse me, I'm lifting a vice, it's a little heavy. Um, that stuff is certainly uh, a nature of how the machine is ground in. So, you know, columns can be shimmed and stuff like that. But outside of that, you're uh, pretty much you would have to regrind the machine on a boxway machine. But of course, a boxway machine gives you a lot more um, rigidity because it's all a game of surface area, right? Linear rails, you just have the, the balls. So the only any surface area you really have is where the bearing and the rail contacts that little point. Well, it'll spread over a bunch of rails. That's why the roller style rails are a little bit more rigid than the ball bearing rails. Um, boxways have a lot more surface, but you lose precision. Okay, how are we doing, Lars? We're looking pretty good. Okay, so we are going to continue on. And uh, here I'm talking, and I probably didn't repeat the question. So that might have been a little confusing to the audience because I got Lars in my, in my ear, but I'm forgetting that the audience can't hear him. So uh, if I did that, I apologize. Okay, so we had said we're now going to set the device. Certainly this would be a time I would have done it before I tram. And I had to make sure my sable surface is nice and clear. Um, if I do have any um, potential dings in the table, I want to stone my table, validate that everything is nice and flat. My surface is free of chips and burrs and all that stuff. Both sides, right? The bottom of the vise, top. And now what I like to do is I like to put my vise down. I like to center it best I can in the T-slot. And then what you want to do is you want to tighten down one of your two bolts that hold down your vise. Um, doesn't really matter which one you tighten. All I'm doing is I'm creating a fulcrum or pivot point. So once I've snugged down the one, we can go back. Now I'm not going to put my indicator in my spindle because I don't want it spinning around. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount it to my cartridge. So now it's nice and rigid. Now for us, this might be a little tricky, but I'm going to try to uh, get it so you can kind of see the needle here. I know it's, it's tough with some of these camera angles. Okay. So. How do I adjust my vise at this stage? So it's really going to be as simple as, oops, give it some juice here. As initially, coming down, take your indicator, and we're going to run our indicator back and forth across the vise. And I just do want to make sure that as I come down, I don't bump my mount. Okay. I normally wouldn't set it up quite like this for sure. I'm doing it for camera angle. I would have the, 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 the indicator face facing. It would be the easiest, but you guys won't be able to see it there if I did that. Okay, so come in. Uh, I'm not too concerned about getting to zero yet. I like to bring the indicator over to my side that I've tightened up. I like to work from that side. And then I'm gonna set a quick zero. All right. Maybe I can verify backlash a little bit there with the hand wheel, make sure it's tracking okay. And now I'm gonna run on down to the far side. So now, by moving my vise, and I'm gonna grab my little persuader here, I can start to tap my vise in. Now, I don't wanna just go to zero, be honest with you, because you're not quite all the way across, right? When I took the measurement, I wasn't at the pivot point, I was to the right of it. So what you're gonna find is you actually have to go a little beyond. So a lot of times I might overshoot the value by a thou or so. And then I'm just gonna run on back. And I'm gonna reset my zero. And actually that one I think was pretty, pretty much on, let's see. Yeah, I'm maybe a half thou. Um, certainly I could keep tweaking it in from there. Um, but that would be the process. And then once I'm there, I'm going to tighten up the other bolt. Um, be careful, you know, lower quality vices. This is a Kurt vice. This is a pretty, pretty good vice. Uh, lower quality vices, 
they might not be perfectly flat so then you go to tighten it and you see the whole thing move so that's an indication that your vise itself isn't actually completely flat um, then you might have to play a game kind of working back and forth as you load or unload those those bolts till you get it true now that is certainly if i had a scenario where i am lucky enough to be able to straighten up my vise but what happens if, and I'm just going to loosen up my bolts here on both sides, what if you got a part, a fixture, a vise for any reason and you cannot get it straight? So I'm purposely kicking this off at an angle, right? So this is a, a unique feature to the Cinemaric Control that you're not going to see in a lot of other controls. So what I can do, and certainly I could run my indicator down and show you, we're going to get a chance to show you in a little bit anyway, so for time's sake. I have the ability to go in, now I can do this with a manual edge finder or a probe, doesn't matter, but I'm going to use my probe because I'm lazy, so I got a nice Marpos probe in my carousel here that we're going to go grab, but we have an align edge function, and the align edge function allows me to measure two points and basically allow the control to align to the part or the machine to align to the part, as opposed to forcing you always to have to align your part to the machine. So where you find that feature is it going to be under your measure workpiece functions. If we zoom on in for you here, I go to measure workpiece and jog, and you're going to look for your square with two indicator markers. Now, if you don't see it here, don't fret. You should have it on any of the A28s and A40, because that is a standard feature within the control. So go in, look at your pull down list, because we have a whole series of probing cycles. Now, in the A28, it's possible you may not have all of them because it is an option, but you do get a line edge. So make sure you pick it. And once you pick it and you back out, the next time it's going to be the one that was there. So you can kind of customize these to how you want. And now you're going to follow the screen. So if you can, you're going to want to follow the process of the screen. So with my probe, I'm going to come over. I'm going to take a measurement. In this case, I have it set up to move in my x-axis, or move in my y-axis, shall I say. Um, certainly, the further apart I can spread the measurement, the more accurate it's going to be. So I get into position. I just want to make sure my probe batteries are good. Yes, they are. I take the one measurement. And now, once I've taken the one measurement, we're going to give you a little indicator there. And let me switch back to the screen so you can see the measurements. Sorry about that, guys. Actually, this one may be a better view. So once I, once I took that first measurement, you're going to see that screen indicator went blue. So all I did was I hit cycle start. The machine oriented the probe, came in, took its measurement, came back, stored it, and it stored it as blue. So we're going to go back and we're going to do it one more time because it just stored both my measurements. I was getting ahead of myself. So you want to get both indicator is blue, but you do have to move the machine in the x-axis in this case before I take the second measurement, or it wouldn't calculate a angle. So I run to the other side, cycle start, takes the next measurement, boom, 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 boom. there's a little delay there, boom. Once it's recorded both, you say set work coordinate, and what it's doing is it's writing to the active work coordinate, in this case G54, or I could have selected a different work coordinate. So, once it's back, everything's happy, it comes back out, I now see a little symbol. I have a little coordinate rotation there. So what did that just do? So in the Siemens control, and this kind of differentiates ourselves from our competition, we actually kept all of the functions or features that you get from these advanced technology machines, and they're in even something as basic as a simple three-axis machine. And one of the things that, that we've incorporated into the control is really taking the work coordinate system and adding a lot of extra functionality than you would typically see. Right, so in a normal CNC, I'm going to have on my G54 line, I'm going to have the ability of setting a linear offset. I'm going to have the ability of maybe setting an angular offset if I have a rotary axis. But beyond that, that's where it kind of ends. Well, that might have been where they ended, but it's kind of where we started. So what we do is, you see there's a little indicator. Let me just zoom into this real quick for you guys. Oh, wrong screen. See there's this little indicator there. It's telling you you have a rotation 
written into the coordinate system. So if you hit the details button while you're in the work coordinate system, you can see everything that the work coordinates can do. They can do course offsets. That's a distance from machine zero to my work coordinate position. You can see fine. That's a small incremental adjustment. But you can also see coordinate rotations. So you have your X, Y, and Z axes. And by taking those two measurements, what the system just did is it said, oh, well, I have about a half a degree of inaccuracy during that setup. So what we're going to show you here, let's jump back to the screen, is what is happening now that we have that rotation active. Okay. And while I'm doing this, Lars, if anybody has any questions, just throw them on out. I'm going to get into position here. So we're coming on down. Oops, let me back up. And shoot. Um, so I'm assuming they're talking about, it's almost like a ring gauge, right? So it's a cylindrical square. It's got a big hole in it and it's flat. Um, really what that does is that allows to offset the fact that you have that flaked table. Um, certainly you could use it here. You don't really need it, but it's okay. Um, where I do like those, even on a C-frame, is you know when the indicator drops into the T-slot and then pops back out, um, it can bounce a little bit and sometimes it can even affect the measurement. So that would be a, a good case for it, but it's really up to you. It's not required, but would certainly work well. All right, so now what we're doing here is I'm just coming in and I'm gonna move the machine and I'm gonna show you. Now, everything looks like it's tracking, right? Well, it's only tracking because I have a little button turned on here and let me go to the other screen so you can see the button called WCS MCS. And this is your magic button. So right now, if I was to move the indicator, you can see that indicator is flying off. I'm sure you guys can see that too as I move it. So this vice is certainly not parallel to the x-axis. So what the WCS MCS button does is it says, how is my jog buttons and my hand wheel going to behave at this stage? So by indicating that hand wheel, I'm saying I want the machine to move relative to the work coordinate system. So now I can set my zero and I can move my axis and hopefully you guys can see from the angle that needle is, is barely moving. Now, certainly um, if you can make everything straight, don't use this as a crutch because your guy's lazy and he doesn't feel like indicating an advice. This is, you know, with anything like with the geometries, I mean, yes, our control has all kinds of settings that allow you to adjust for compensations and, and error in the machine. But at the end of the day, the better you can get your initial setup, the closer you can get the machine, the better the parts that you make are going to be. So now, just to finalize, we're going to set some basic zeros. I know we're slightly over our time, but I'm just going to be a time hog and keep on going. So hopefully you guys don't mind. I try to shoot for a half an hour, but you know, to be honest with you, when I run through these, this content, I am uh, never 100% sure that I'm gonna make it right on time. A lot of it has to do with questions that arise and whatnot. So we're gonna put our part in our vise. I threw it up on a couple parallels you should have seen there. Um, I do wanna knock her in, right? Cause a lot of times they'll pick up a little bit. So I wanna make sure if I can get it that both of my parallels are not moving around. Now it's down and secure. And then from there, I'm gonna go back and there's really two ways in the control to set a zero right to the coordinate system. I can certainly use this basic set work offset function. So if I come into it, I can just move to some location. I can say set zero. I can type a value in it. If I knew like, hey, I'm some set distance away. So this is kind of a quick down and dirty method to set a zero. Now you do wanna be careful with this. You do have to preload a work offset to be able to access this function, right? So if I come in, and I have like my G500 or my base offset loaded, or maybe my machine boots up without an active work coordinate, you notice that button is grayed out. So I can't do anything with this button. So that's really the trick. The measure workpiece functions, they are not grayed out at this stage because they allow you to tell it which work coordinate you want to set. Now, certainly I can go grab my Marpos probe and I can start setting zeros, but a lot of people don't realize that I can still use the old fashioned edge finder 
and use all of our integrated probing or measuring cycles. So they will change how they work based on what I have in the spindle. Now in my case, I have a carousel full of tools. I don't have room for this edge finder. So this is a case where I can use my unloaded tool library. So anything below one of these tool locations is a tool that exists in memory, but it's sitting external to the machine. So on my case, I had built an edge finder. You can build it as an edge finder, you can build it as an end mill, it's gonna work the same way. And when I try to tool change to an unloaded tool, what the machine is gonna do is it would put back whatever tool was in the machine at any given point, in this case it didn't have one, and then it's gonna prompt me, you can see what the message is, to do a manual tool change. I finish it with a final acknowledgement, now that tool's in the spindle. I can use that tool if I'm running apart, so if you have a big face mill or something and you can't, physically get it in the machine, you can certainly do that. Um, now, I'm gonna throw out a question to the audience. We'll see what you guys, um, what you guys think. So, I wanna poll everybody. What is the preferred RPM for an edge finder that you would wanna be running? So let's see what you guys say, and then I will tell you what uh, kind of I was always told. So I'm gonna to kick this sucker. So we'll give you a minute or two to respond. So Lars, you tell me when we have some, uh, some guesses as to the optimal RPM. I don't think there's necessarily any perfect answer here, but I'm interested to see what everybody says. So in this case, I'm using a standard edge finder, right? So I'm gonna do the old kick method. So you wanna come in, if you have a nice heavy wobble and your eyes aren't as good anymore like mine, it makes it easier to see when you're approaching. You want to, can you see it? Uh, it's really hard for you guys to see, unfortunately, but you're going to bring it in. I know you guys are machines. You know how to use an edge finder. So I'm going to bring it in until I see it kick. Once it kicks, now I can set my edge, right? So if I go to measure workpiece, I can go to my edge kick function or my edge set, and then I want to satisfy the screen, right? What axis am I going to be setting? I'm going to set my X. What direction was I moving in? So I'm on the left side of the part. And then what is the edge considered? Not where am I, because I'm 100 thou off of that edge. But the system will take into account the tool radius automatically. So by using the manual set work coordinate, boom, I just set it. And you see on the screen there, I'm not at zero, I'm 100 thou away, because I'm the radius of that edge finder off. So that is certainly a nice, quick way. And, and really just about all of our cycles will work with a standard edge finder. But certainly, I can now go the next step and use my probe. So just as simple as selecting a probe as opposed to an edge finder or a manual tool in my spindle, so in this case, she's gonna prompt me to take the tool out. So I wanna remember that, that's important. And I wanna stuff them on each other, cycle again. Now it's gonna go grab my edge finder and I can come repeat the same process I certainly have a whole library of probing cycles. Um, I would say that if you're interested in all the different kinds, I did do a webinar that you can find on our YouTube channel on this topic. I just kind of wanted to show you how the mechanics of the whole thing work. So you pre-position the probe in the direction. Actually, since we already used X, why don't we set Y, right? Might as well do something a little different. So maybe I'm finding, you know, the most common when setting is zero. You want to work off your, your fixed jaw. So that would be the jaw that does not move. All right. I pre-position, measure, I'm going to do the edge kick again. And, and keep in mind, there's a whole library of different strategies, finding holes, finding bores. You know, set up, now you see that the, the probe now is indicated, and you see a little probe picture instead of that end mill or edge finder. You lose the set button, because now it's just waiting for you to do a cycle start. The machine is going to turn on the probe, come on in, and then automatically write to that appropriate offset. And everything is getting then driven right to that given offset. So if we looked at our work coordinates, we have 11.9 and 3.86. So that's the distance from wherever machine zero is on this machine to the corner of this block. And my part is now set. So with that being said, I know we ran over a little bit, but um, if there's any other questions out there, I'd certainly uh, love to take some time and answer them before we wrap up. 
So what do we got, Lars? Okay, so let me, uh, let me give everybody the question because I, I know you can probably see it on the screen there. But basically what the, uh, um, what the question was is the coordinate rotation, will it work in any given axis? Um, and do I need to use G18 or G19 to activate? So the answer is yes. You could certainly put a rotation in any axis, but you do want to be careful there. So let's say for argument's sake, I, and we can just kind of show it real quick, I put in a value, I'm just going to move up the machine, and then in it I put in a value about my y-axis of 30 degrees. I'm going to put in something dramatic here. So what did I just cause to happen? I just tipped the, and we're going to move the x. I just tipped the coordinate system. What did I put it in for the wrong axis? New. No. Why is that triggering funky? Of course, all this stuff happens when I'm doing a line. But anyway, the, the end result here is going to be machine values. Yeah, there you, there you can see. See how my two numbers are adjusting? So if I command the machine to move relative to the plane, you can see I'm actually tipping my coordinate system. So now my tool is no longer perpendicular to that plane. So generally speaking, that would not be a good solution on this machine because now I'm going to cause my end mill to heel or toe in. I guess in theory, if I was just compensating for a slight tram issue, you, you could try to try to get around it that way. Um, where you would want to use this is if you had a machine with a, a head that is adjustable, right? So uh, it's pretty common in some of these three axis mills. You have like a bridge port style, quill style head and you can tip them left to right. So now I could tip that head on an angle and have everything work on that plane. And now that tool would move around in that plane perpendicular to the head. So hopefully that answers that question. Anything else, Lars? Oh, good. Yes, we didn't get back to that. Perfect. So what, what did they say? <laughs> All right. So, so what Lars is just saying is we got some people to chime in regarding our RPM topic. We've got 750 RPM. We got 999.9. .9. And uh, from my side, uh, I was always taught two different RPMs, 800 or 1,000. And it seems like who you talk to, it's funny, those two are real close to the, the two I'm mentioning. Um, that seems to be kind of the, the differential. Um, I myself like to run it at 1,000. That was what I ran this one at. Um, what, what's the behavior or why would we have two different RPMs there? Well, pros and cons to both. The slower you run the RPM on an edge finder, the more chance you could overrun the edge before you see the edge finder kick, right? So next thing you know, I'm not perfectly on the edge. I may be a thou or two off. So the higher the RPM, the better you'll see that. But you want to be real careful that you don't go exceed, and I usually say 1,000 RPM. Um, we got the, the one gentleman said 999.9. .9. There you go. The only thing holding this tip in place is a spring. <laughs> you run this thing at five grand, that tip will no longer be attached to this edge finder and she'll, she's shot. If you're lucky, it's still flopping around. If you're not lucky, it just went across the shop. All right, anything else? All right, well, we got some really great feedback. I certainly appreciate everybody and also hanging on. We did go a little bit over, but hopefully you found this stuff real educational. Again, thank you, Lars, for helping out. Um, and thank you guys for watching. Certainly, by all means, remember to like, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, and, and share these videos. You get them out there. The more you like them, the more they're going to let me keep recording them. So with that being said, I want to say good afternoon, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye.